but now is the time to do what you're told. <laughs> and that's what we focus on as scientists. I know we're living in a charged political environment, but that's something that is not primary for us. We just continue to do our job to foster public health, but also to do the science that leads to the things like the vaccine that you mentioned in the introduction that was just mentioned by the dean in the introduction. But, you know, on a serious note, you know, you and your family have had, have had threats against your life because you've defended science instead of defending the White House. So I just, how did science become so politicized? Well, that's an important question, but also a sad that you have to ask that question because that is what we have seen uh, a lot in the United States, but not just restricted to the United States because we're also seeing it with my colleagues in the UK and in Europe and in other regions of the world. Uh, I, I don't think there's a simple explanation for it, but I think there has been an anti-authority uh, 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 component to this. You know, we had anti-vax, people don't like to be told to be vaccinated. Scientists are often perceived as authoritarian, and sometimes, in fact, they've made that uh, perception themselves by the way they act. I think we can improve on that. But right now, it has been just lumped into the politics of what's going on. We live in a divisive society, and even if we didn't have a pandemic, it would be a divisive society. And the fact that we do have a pandemic, and a pandemic is a public health issue, and public health is intimately related to science, that all of a sudden, science gets caught in a lot of this divisiveness. And that's unfortunate. And what we as scientists hope, I know that my colleague Francis Collins feels the same way, that when we get past this, science will resume its really rightful place in being something that's for everyone without divisions. Uh, first of all, we've got to think globally. Pandemics are global. So we have to pull together globally. There's a thing called a global health security network or agenda that was established several years ago. We need to strengthen that. We need to strengthen our international collaborations. We need to have people speaking to each other in surveillance. It's got to be open and transparent. When you do that, you can detect it early and respond early. Scientific approaches, technologies, are going to allow us to do what we did with this outbreak, rapidly make a vaccine. We can do even better than that, but you can't do science alone. It's got to be public health and classic science. So are there countries that you, you know, there are countries that seem to be doing well that then weren't doing so. Are there countries now that hold up as models for, you know, pretty good response to this? You know, the answer is yes, but right now it seems that every country is suffering. Yeah. We are often compared with countries that are not comparable to us. We are not a little island of five million people that we can shut off. We're not a country that would accept if a ruler tells us, you must do this. I was talking with our UK colleagues just today who were saying, the UK is very similar to where we are now in outbreak because each of our countries have that independent spirit of we don't want to be told what to do. Well, I understand that, but now is the time to do what you're told. <laughs> but now is the time to do what you're told. <laughs> and I think it really is something that we should be doing right now. If you all would join me up here and we'll spread out across the front. We're blessed by having all of you with us this evening. Thank you. And God bless and keep all of you out there. I hope you will stay safe and sound and well. And may the blessing of our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always.